Hey, today we are going to continue on in our series that we've entitled Rhythms. And uh, by the way, aren't you so thankful for Pastor Garrett and just his leadership? I'm so thankful for him. And uh, man, I, I, I couldn't wait to be back out here for uh, those who... Uh, maybe, maybe no, Amber and I and our family, we had the opportunity to take a short four week sabbatical, uh, in the month of July. And so that was an opportunity. Some of you are like short. Well, some people take longer sabbaticals. It was a condensed sabbatical. Uh, but man, what an incredible time for us to be refreshed and renewed. And I just believe with all of my heart, the greatest days are in front of us as life center. Uh, we are believing for greater things. So uh, this series entitled Rhythms, we've been looking into the book of Psalms and we're looking at a number of different rhythms that are important for our lives as followers of Jesus. We find our anchor in Jesus' words, Matthew chapter 11, starting in verse 28. And I'm gonna use Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of this. It's a modern day paraphrase. Jesus' words, he says this, are you tired? Anybody ever been there? Wow. How many of you are there right now? Okay, wake up. Here we go. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Then listen to this three-word invitation. Come to me. Would you say those three words with me? Come to me. Listen, for those of you who find yourself exhausted by change after change in life, for those who are exhausted by all of the dynamics in the world around you, those of you who are burdened down by life, Jesus offers you something more than just more religion. He says, come to me. Come to me. He says, come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real Rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I want you to notice that, that last statement. Keep company with him. Notice how personal that is. He, he doesn't say, hey, just show up at church once a week and, and be around other people who follow me. He says, no, keep company with me and I'll show you how to live. His way, his design. Today, I, I want to talk about another important rhythm in our lives. I, I want to talk about a rhythm called reading. A rhythm called reading. Now really quick, let me ask, have you ever missed out on how good something is just because of a wrong assumption? You ever made that mistake? You, you assume something about something and yet your assumption was wrong and because you assumed the wrong thing, you missed out and you felt like you really missed out. Now when I was growing up, there was one thing in my diet that I ate that was green. It was green beans. So that was the only green thing that I ate in my diet. It was the only thing that I was convinced that was good or even from God. <laughs> and then I got married. And my wife, Amber, she's sitting over here on the front row. She, she helped me learn that, no, Tyler, you actually like, and if you don't yet like it, you will learn to like it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You will, you will learn to like some, some green things. And it, it opened up a whole new world for me. I discovered shortly after marriage that I actually love this thing called broccoli. Yeah. It's amazing. Now, broccoli raw is not from God. Broccoli cooked is from God. Can I get an amen? But a number of years ago, I, I went to a restaurant with a friend and they ordered Brussels sprouts. And I remember thinking to myself, why would you not only inflict yourself with that? Why would you pay money to inflict yourself with that? Anybody following me today? And, and this, this friend of mine looked at me and said, you just need to try it. I said, I'm, I'm not going to try it. I don't need to try it. I, I know what those things look like. I've heard too many stories. I want nothing to do with them. But 
But he convinced me, and all of a sudden they, they brought these roasted Brussels sprouts out. That, that were, they were cut in half. They were roasted. Then they were roasted with bacon. Not only that, they, they were drizzled with balsamic yes. vinaigrette, yes. some sea salt on top. And friends, can I tell you, when I bit into those Brussels sprouts, I found myself going, why did nobody tell me? <laughs> I've spent like almost 40 years at that point of my life in the dark. I missed out on something that was so good all because of an assumption. Uh -huh. Have you been there? Yeah. Have you been there? Well, today, listen, I want to, I want to talk about this book right here. Cause I'm here to remind you there's, there's nothing that has transformed my life more than this book. See, there's a lot of assumptions in our world about this book. There's a lot of opinions about this book. There's a lot of perspectives about this book. And, and some, they look at this book and, and they just see it as a historical document that actually has no power to do anything in their life. And so they treat it as such. Others, they, they say, well, Tyler, I, I'm not really into reading. That's not really my thing. And, and the challenge is there's a lot of individuals who they show up every week at church. Hopefully the pastor has some type of God-given grace to make something that feels outdated, historic, a little bit out of touch with our lives. And maybe the pastor can, can tell some jokes and make it interesting enough to, to give you a little bit of inspiration. But let me talk about this book for a second. Because this book is amazing. Yes, it's a historical text, but it's also a, a sacred text that has lasted the test of time. You see, you need to understand, critics and opponents, they've tried to stamp it out or discredit it, yet it remains. Not only that, it claims to be inspired by God and the ultimate authority and authoritative over our lives. It is God's revelation to humanity. Now, some of us were, were familiar with this book and, and maybe you have one of these books with you today or maybe your book is on your phone, which is okay. But let me talk about this book for a second. What is it? Well, it's 66 individual books woven together in two major sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament has 39 books. The New Testament has 27 books. It was written by 40 different authors over a span of 1,600 years, yet when you put it all together, it speaks one cohesive message that all humanity needs to know. And what is that? There's a God that loves them, has provided a way for them to come in to experience the full life that Jesus alone offers. This book matters. See, all of this, it points to God's purpose and God's key plan. What is that? Relationship with him. To undo the curse of the garden and bring us back into this abiding relationship with him. Go with me to the book of 2 Timothy if you have your Bibles. And if not, don't worry, it'll be up on the screen. You can follow along. 2 Timothy, though, chapter 3, verse 16 says this. All scripture. Can you say all? All, all scripture. What does that mean? It, it means all of it. Even Leviticus style? Yes, all of it. All of it. And, and this matters because this last Wednesday, I was meeting with my life group. Jim Stellman was, was on uh, together with our life group. And, and I remember uh, we we're, were journeying through the book of Judges and we read one of those Chapters. Anybody come across one of those chapters? Keith, you were there. Uh, we, we read one of those chapters and we're kind of scratching our heads going, okay, God, I know there's a purpose in here. And, and here's what was amazing. As we continued to talk and pray through it, all of a sudden there was, there was learning points and teaching points. Guess what? All scripture is inspired 
by God. In other words, Scripture is claiming about itself that all of this is is God-breathed, it's inspired. And, And here's the point. It is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. Scripture matters. Why? Because it's inspired by God. It's not man-made. It's not man-created. And my question that I want us to consider over the next couple of minutes that we have together is this. Do you engage with this book like God actually has something to say to you? More than just when we show up on a weekend here at the Rainier Campus, do do we engage with Scripture Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday? Do we we engage with Scripture like God actually wants to speak to you, that he he has something to say about the circumstances that you're going through, that, that he has some hope to deposit into your life? Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, we're going to read it right now. Just a few verses of it. Psalm 119, listen to what it says in in verse 9. I love how the psalmist unpacks the the significance and the centrality of the word of God in their life. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word. Would you repeat that line with me? By keeping your word. I've sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. I've treasured your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Lord, may you be blessed. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I proclaim all the judgments from your mouth. I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts. And think about your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Now here the author of this psalm is is reflecting on the, the importance, the significance, the weight of God's word. His precepts, his wisdom, his instruction, his law. And over and over, he calls himself to to not only remember the word, but to walk the word out, to to live in alignment with the word of God. But, But here's what I've come to know. You cannot follow what you don't know. And you can't know what you neglect to engage with. You, You can't follow what you don't know, and you will never know what you neglect to engage with. That, that's the big idea today. It will be impossible for me to follow the truth of Scripture if I don't know Scripture. And it will be impossible for me to know Scripture unless I actually engage with Scripture. Anybody see how that works together? And this is so important because a lot of us, we want the blessing of God, but are we willing to walk in the way that God has lined out? That's where the blessing resides. We talk often about this idea of life to the full. John 10.10, it's Jesus' design. It's his plan. We want every life in Pierce County to experience the life in Jesus. But we can't do it disconnected from the truth of his word. We need it. we got to reside in it. You see, here's why reading this book matters. If I don't read it, I won't know it. And if I don't know it, I can't believe in it. And if I don't believe it, it has no power or authority in my life. If it holds no authority in my life, yet it claims to be authoritative, infallible, and true, I'm left to my own resources wisdom, and insight. But the opposite is true as well. Because if I do read it, guess what? I will know it. And if I do know it, guess what? I will begin to believe it. And as I begin to believe it, it begins to have power and authority in my life. And if it has power and authority in my life, it is authoritative. It is infallible. It is true. And guess what? I can lean into the resources, the wisdom, and the insight of God. 
See, this matters. You can't follow what you don't know. And you can't know what you neglect to engage with. Think about the words in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, he's rebuking some of the false prophets of his time. They were claiming to to hold the words of God. And he says, no, 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 you're twisting God's word. Let's declare what God's word actually is like. And Jeremiah says this, is not my word like fire? This is the Lord's declaration. And like a hammer that pulverizes rock. In other words, you want to know what God's word is like? It's like an all-consuming fire. It is like a hammer that can break rock to pieces. In other words, God's word has effect. It does something. I've never met anybody who authentically engages with this word and their life is just left the same. It has effect in our lives. This this matters. And, And let me be clear today. Our issue is not access. We live in a generation that has more access to Scripture than any other generation that has ever walked the face of the earth. It's on your phone. It's on the internet. Listen, you can listen to podcasts. You can actually buy a paper book on Amazon called a Bible. There, there is so much access to Scripture. And by the way, if you're here today and you honestly do not have a Bible, talk to me afterwards. We will give you a Bible. Our issue is not access, is it? It's not access. But this brings me to common objections that I often hear. Maybe, maybe you've heard these. Maybe you've said these. Objection number one, well, well, Tyler, you know, I just don't like to read. False. You read your text messages every day. I love you. You read your emails every day. You... Scroll through your Facebook feed and you tend to know what your neighbors are eating for dinner every day. You see, that's, it's a false idea. Well, I just don't like to read. No, no, no. We all read at, at some level. And so we have to toss that objection aside. Another objection is this. Well, Tyler, I would, I just don't know where to start. And if that's your objection, man, I'm so glad that you're here today. Why? Because I've had conversations throughout the years where people will come to me and say, Tyler, I, I tried to get into the Bible. And man, you started at the beginning. where That's where most people start, right? So you start in Genesis and everything's going good. You get to Exodus. And then you hit Leviticus. <laughs> and you're like, wait, what? Here's my encouragement to you. Do you know that Life Center actually has an annual year-long Bible reading plan and you can read a portion of the Gospels every day. You can read some Gospels and Proverbs every day. There, there, there's a scaling opportunity for you to engage with Scripture every single day. And even if you're a new Jesus follower, listen, I would encourage you, just start in the book of John. Just start walking through, learning about the life and the ministry and the teaching of Jesus because here's a little spoiler alert. It all points to him anyways. Everything in the Old Testament looks forward to his arrival. Everything post the Gospels looks back at his finished work and his life and his teaching and his ministry. Friends, it's all about him. It's all about Jesus. So set those objections aside. And today, let me talk about two things that the rhythm of reading accomplishes in our lives. Number one is this. It reads me and reveals what I can't see. Here's why reading scripture for yourself outside of Sunday morning when when you get a little bit of biblical content, here's why this matters. When you engage with scripture, you want to know what it does? It begins to read you and it reveals what you cannot see in and of yourself. Sometimes I just need to be honest with myself. 
How many of you know that's the truth in your life as well? And sometimes we're, we're good at, at not really seeing what needs to be seen. To help drive this point home, take a moment, check out this video. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing- You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine, I will listen, fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on, Ow. if you would just- Don't! Try to see things my way. Come on. Now, I won't ask for a show of hands, but how many times have we avoided hearing what we simply just need to hear? We, we don't want to face the reality, but this is what Scripture does. Sometimes Scripture just goes, hey, there's a nail in your head. And let me help you pull it out. And we're like, well, I don't, I don't really think, I don't believe in nail. No, no, let Scripture reveal what's actually there. How often do we settle for not wanting to hear what we need to hear? I love this quote from Tim Keller. He says this, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. And yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Amen. See, the, the message of grace, the, the gospel, the good news becomes good news when we actually begin to see the condition that we're actually in. That's what scripture does, but it doesn't just expose what it needs to be exposed. It also provides the solution, the hope, the antidote to where we find ourselves. You see, I've learned a long time ago, I don't just read scripture. What happens? Well, when I open up this book, it's like a mirror. And I begin to see things in me that I did not see by myself. How many times you open up the Bible or, or you hear maybe something preached from Scripture and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit uses that moment to press on an, an attitude that needs to change. And you didn't see it before, but all of a sudden as you look into Scripture, it reflects back, it reveals what's actually going on. Attitude and action, a heart motivation. See, Scripture, it, it actually reveals what's going on. It, it reads me. In other words, it reads and exposes my attitudes. It reads beyond my actions to the level of my motivations. It, it reveals the idols that I set up to and cling to and, and hope. It breaks wide open and exposes my longing for self-rule and self-sufficiency, much like our original parents, Adam and Eve. See, in grace, it brings me to the end of myself and brings me to my senses. The importance of reading is this, it, it reveals, it, it reads me, but it also reveals what I can't see. But, but here's the second thing that happens when we read scripture, we engage with it. It reminds me of who God is and who I am in him. 
This is why reading scripture is so very, very important. It continues, yes, to reveal what I can't see, but even in the midst of navigating that pain at times of going, man, I'm messed up. Anybody else ever read scripture and you're like, I have some issues, God. I got some stuff. And yet scripture never leaves you there. It always points to a God who loves you. And ultimately, not just who you are, but who you are in him. That, that's the point. That's the point. I want to remind you today as we open up scripture, we are not the central figure. So many people open up their Bibles and they think it's all about them. Let me help you. It's not all about you. Scripture actually opens up with these four words. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God. See, this book is all about God and His plan, but ultimately how we fit into His plan and who we can be in Him. And we can't live void of that. We, we read Scripture and we need to ask this question. What does it say? What does it mean? And then we get to the third question. What does that mean to me? After I've deciphered, what does it say? What does that mean for the original audience, for the context? And now, how does that speak to me? You see, Scripture, it reminds me. What does it remind me of? It reminds me of hope, of grace, of mercy, of love. It reminds me of not only a covenant-making God, but listen, a covenant-keeping God. That's good news. Because God will be faithful to keep his covenant. It reminds me that when I am faithless, he is faithful. It reminds me that he is greater no matter what I'm up against. It reminds me that I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. It reminds me that though I was once dead in my sin, I've been made alive by faith in Christ Jesus. And friends, we need to learn this rhythm of reading. Why? Because we live life 24-7 in need of truth that will transform us and rescue us and change us. One hour a week at a church gathering is not enough. I wanna challenge you, adopt a rhythm called reading. It'll change you. And I say that with conviction, why? Because nothing has changed my life more than getting into this book. Why? Because it's in this book that the grace of Jesus, the gospel, the good news was actually revealed to me and it changed this man. It transformed me. And guess what it continues to do? It continues to change me. It continues to transform me. And I so desperately want that for each of us. Today, I want to talk about a few different next steps that I want to challenge you with. And number one is this. Maybe today is your day to say yes to Jesus. Maybe you want to experience that transformation, but, but the, the pathway to that transformation is faith in who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And today, I want to create space for those who want to say yes. They want to put their trust in Jesus. Here's the good news. Our sin, our shame, our separation is dealt with in Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. And the pathway to transformation begins with that yes to making him king and Lord over your life. But here's the second next step, and, and this is a big one, and I, I want you to lean in today, okay? Life Center, I want you to lean in and listen. I want to challenge you to commit for the next 30 days to Bible first. Can you say Bible first? Here's what this means. How many of you, you're with me? Come on, let me see a show of hands. Let me see a show of hands. You might not want to put those up yet because here's what this means. 30 days to Bible first means this. I'm going to commit to not touching my phone for 30 days until I read some scripture. Yeah, I didn't expect a lot of rousing amens right there. See, some of us, we, we are programmed and conditioned to start our day with bad news. 
Before you, before you even get out of bed, before your feet hit the floor, what do you do? You open up your news app and you see what's going wrong in the world. You, you open up social media and you begin to compare your life to somebody else's life before your feet even hit the ground. And here's what I wanna challenge you, because I believe that some of us, if we will take this challenge, our lives will be different 30 days from now compared to where we're currently at. If you will dedicate, and I'm not saying before you, before you even get out of bed, read 10 chapters. Man, even if it's just a few verses, start with scripture. And some of you right now, you're making arguments with me. I see it in your eyes, I see it. Some of you right now are going, Tyler, how do I do that? My cell phone is my alarm clock. Stop it. Stop. Turn your alarm off. Grab your Bible. If you don't have a real one, because some of you are going, well, my Bible is on my phone. Okay. Don't touch your news. Don't touch your text messages. Don't touch your email. Don't touch social media. Simply open up scripture. And even if it's two minutes, scripture first for 30 days. Come on, how many of you are gonna take that challenge with me? 30 days, let's do it. Come on, Life Center, we can do that. We can do that. Here's the, the third next step. By the way, hold each other accountable. I saw some hands, okay? So like, if you saw your spouse and all of a sudden you see the glow, you know, in the early morning, <laughs> I give you freedom to use those elbows as a source of the Holy Spirit, just like, no, scripture first, okay? Here's the third next step, and I end with this. Maybe you don't have a plan. And this is where so many of us, we, we, we kind of get off track because when, when we fail to plan, it's a little bit like planning to fail. And some of us, our Bible reading looks a little bit like this. Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Okay, time for breakfast. There, there's something significant about having a plan because it keeps you moving through scripture systematically. It helps you understand God's ultimate design and plan for you, for salvation, for the world in which we live. Amen.